Uh, somebody in, in the gallery, I think, um, accused Francis of uh, bad-mouthing his contemporaries at Harrow and suggesting that people who go to public schools are just a bunch of upper-class twits um, who are basically thick and they buy their education. Well, that's not what we're saying at all. Uh, what we're saying is that uh, probably they are higher than average in both wealth and intelligence. Who knows? What I'm saying, which isn't necessarily what my colleagues are saying, what I'm saying is that setting up that beacon of expectation throughout society, which is about the only beacon there is left because we have denigrated the rest of those things you might aspire towards, like dignity in labor, like working class dignity, like all those other things which have been thrown out with, by Thatcherism to say, make money, make your children make money, spend your money, buy your education. Having that is a terrible, terrible blight on this country. Now, in 1958, Michael Young, who on the good side wrote the Labour Party Manifesto in 1945, on the bad side fathered Toby Young, wrote <laughs> the much cited but universally unread satire, The Rise of the Meritocracy. Blair was always talking about the meritocracy. People are always talking about the meritocracy. Is it wonderful? OK, public schools are a bad thing because they're not meritricious, but they're not meritorious. But people don't understand what Young was saying because they never read his book, but he was writing a satire from the point of view of somebody writing in 2033 about how they had created society based on educational merit, on IQ, and a new meritorious elite had appeared. And of course, consequently, there was a new underclass, an underclass of the stupid, for want of a better word who had nothing to hope for, nothing to live for, had no role except to serve the new elite. But I'm talking about the nation as a whole. I'm talking about everybody. And it's worth bearing in mind how that book re uh, finishes. And I strongly recommend you actually read it. Somebody should read it. Because the narrator of the book ends up being killed in the revolution staged by the new underclass to overthrow their oppressors. And I'm not calling for us to string up Barnaby quite yet, we'll do that outside in the street and we'll be helped by one of, his, uh, one of his side, but we're talking about blighting the country. That means everybody. That means having too high an expectation of that 20% of people who may never learn to read and write, give them something else to aspire towards. Thank you, Barnaby. Well, on behalf of my side, I want to finish on a bitter note that over the past 13 years, we have become sickened by the hypocrisy of the left wing in Britain, by John Prescott, who spouted all that stuff about fox hunting and Etonians, who played croquet in his grace and favor mansion, whose house in Hull has crenulations, and whose non-parliamentary earnings ran into six figures, enough to keep Pauline in hairspray for all time, of Neil and Glenys Kinnock and all the other multi-millionaires of the political class who have spent their lives knocking public schools. And I would suggest that we no longer entertain the arguments from the leftier-than-thou journalists who deplore public schools until they themselves have children, at which point they either abandon their principles in favor of a decent private education for their kids, or they do a Tony Blair who signed up teachers from the private Westminster school and had them scuttling down to 10 Downing Street in the middle of the night to tutor his sons. Francis. Well, blimey O'Reilly, as they say at Harrow. Um, I have no idea who Barnaby was getting at there, um, but obviously he's quite right. The real blight on this country is John Prescott and Neil and Glenys Kinnock. They're the ones with all the power. They're the ones who destroy the social fabric, who distort everything in society. It's not the vast uh, setup of the public schools. It's Mr. and Mrs. Kinnock, multimillionaires apparently now, I didn't know that, and John Prescott, the late Deputy Prime Minister. 
well, bollocks to that, frankly. And bollocks <laughs> to all this stuff about left holier than thou lefty journalist. I don't know what that was, but if you're talking about me, my children go to the local comprehensive school. They don't go to the local, um, whatever it is, Blairite Catholic school. They don't go to the local private school. And as I think I mentioned in the programme for this event, I would rather eat Piers Morgan's vomit than send my children to a private school, whether it be Harrow or anywhere else. So we'll have no more of that, thank you very much. Yeah. Now, on to the subject. Um, <clears throat> the point about public schools is not that they... Um, Barnaby told us very uh, correctly that they achieve amazing results. Uh, they have subsidiaries in Mauritius and the People's Republic of China. They produce Olympic gold medal winners, rowing teams, all that sort of stuff. Amazing Oxbridge entrance results. Well, so they jolly well should, given the vast amount of resources at their disposal, far better resource than state schools, and the pupil-teacher ratio and all the rest of it. It would be shocking if that weren't the case. But the point of purpose of education is not just to produce lots of A-star exam results that get you shoved up to the top of the league tables. It's not even to have an outpost in the People's Republic of China. It's actually to produce people who can live together and work together with all sorts and conditions and classes of people for the common good. This is not what happens in public schools. Public schools shut children away in a place where they meet only people of their own class and they don't have to engage with anyone else in the rest of society. And I should know because I was part of it. Um, when I ran away at the age of 16, I had never until that moment in my life met a single person who was working class. That's the point. Keep you away from the great unwashed. And only last weekend, just before this debate, I was having dinner with a neighbour who has two sons that go to Eton, rather appropriately. And uh, he was talking to my wife and he said, I've told my boys... If they ever get caught with drugs, ever, ever, I'll take them away from Eton and send them to the local comprehensive. <laughs> um, given that, as he well knows, our sons go to the local comprehensive, my wife was slightly <laughs> offended by this and said, is that really the worst you can think of for your children? <laughs> and it turned out that it was. That's the problem with this whole thing. His boys at Eton... They'll never meet people like the people who go to, children my, go to school with my children. They'll go on to Oxford or Cambridge and into one of the professions, still mingling with the same 7% of people who went to public schools with them, and they will remain utterly ignorant for the rest of their lives about everyone else who lives outside this little cocoon, 93% of their, of their fellow citizens. It's not even, as I said earlier, social engineering or social exclusion. It is, as someone else said, apartheid. And I'm frankly impressed that the organisers of this debate were able to find anyone tonight to come here and defend social apartheid. And they've made a good fist of it. Uh, I've never before seen a professor um, wearing a fob watch hurl himself into a mosh pit. Um, I half <laughs> expected him to strip off his clothes and say, I'm Iggy Pop, can I sell you some car insurance? But it, um, it's an amazing performance, but it's all gibberish, frankly. All they're defending is the indefensible. Don't buy it. Well, thank you very much indeed to all the speakers and thank you to all your contributions from the floor. The time has now come to reveal the result of the debate. And just to remind you that on your way in, you voted 404, 585 against, and 266 don't knows. Um, this time, the don't knows have reduced to 68. So in favor of the motion, 453, and against the motion, 763. So the motion is defeated.